Well, it's so good to be here with all of you again, and it's always a joy to be able to bring the Word of God and to be able to preach over the weekend, to share what God has put upon my heart. But before I do that, I've got a very, very nice thing to do. How many of you were out on TCS Flag Day last weekend? Woo! Woo! Did you have fun? Well, it was a tremendous uh, uh, effort on your part, and so I want to just say a very special thank you to all of you, whether here or in Suntech, for doing your part to help us on this very special fundraising event. As you all know, for TCS, flag days are never just about flag days and it's never just about going out there to just put out a can and get people to drop some money into that that can. It's all about us going out there to bless the nation, to bless everyone. You know, I hope you have everyone you gave a flag to, you would have said, God bless you, God bless you. You know, and and it is really uh, a joy to see so many of you out there over the weekend. And as I got to the counting centre at the end of the day, uh, there was a buzz, okay, and the buzz was this. Wow, this year the tins are heavier. This year the, the, the notes are a lot more, okay. And so I've got a great pleasure to announce to you that last weekend we collected from the streets alone, just from the streets alone, okay, 305,000, okay, 305,000, right, which just the, the number just came in only yesterday evening, okay. Uh, what happened was that on Saturday night, we started counting and we, we were stopped. We couldn't carry on counting until 3.30 a.m., okay? Uh, we had to stop counting because uh, the building that we were in counting, they closed us down. They said we were too late already, you know, and we still had about 20 more bags to count. So, so we had to do all that and then uh, send it in to the security people. And also it was really a tremendous joy. So thank you again for helping us and, and, and I, I, mean, I know that some of the adopt the tins kind of uh, envelopes are still coming into us. And as of this day, we already got 12,000 out of that. And so right now, the, the flag day collection stands at 317,000. Okay, 317,000. And thank God for each and every one of you. So turn to the neighbor and say, well done. <laughs> let, me, let me share with you one more thing, one more thing. Okay, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the feedback and the response have been uh, tremendous because uh, when, when some of our people went out on the streets, especially all of you from church, okay, you all went out on the street. I heard one of the feedback was that, you know, every time they see a flag seller, they think it's this school boy or school girl, you know, trying to do their CIP, okay. But they saw so many adults out there. They saw so many families out there, children out there. It was really a very special thing. And, and, and many of them, in fact, I think gave more because you were the older ones, on there, okay, right. And since, uh, since you went, went out there, they, they wanted to support more. And there were stories about people who, who went up and down the cans and gave more than, than, than necessary. There were the children that went to the market. And, and let me tell you one other great joy for me as the, as the executive director of TCS. It has been a tremendous joy for us where, when we send our clients out. You know, TCS serve a lot of clients, the elderly, the, the handicapped and the needy and all. And we've always used Flag Day as a very special opportunity for them to themselves be able to contribute to the services that they have been, uh, been a beneficiary of. So many of the old people, they will go all to the market, uh, they will go to their market seller, fishmonger, and make them all give, you know, into their cans. And, and so uh, it is really a joy. And, and they will not stop until their cans are full. Okay, many of them will do that. And because it's their way of contributing back to all that they have received even through uh, uh, the TCS program. So thank you again. Thank you for praying with us. And we hope next year or the year after, right, uh, it will depend whether we can even do better. Okay, and another fact is that this year we actually put out less cans. Okay, that means we, uh, the amount of cans that went out are lesser. So on an average, I told the team, this year we got what we call a jubilee blessing. It was nearly double than our average uh, can collections every year. So thank God again. Come on, praise God. Amen. 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 Well, it is my joy today to just come and bring the Word of God to you. Uh, it's my privilege and honor as I share this week's message with you. Yes, you all know we are into a new series, okay? And this is the second message in this new series. We're going to go through the book of Acts. And this whole series is entitled, To the Ends of the Earth. Why don't we all read the key verse together that's found in first Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And it says, let's read it together. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And to the ends of the earth, okay? 
You know, this message series, I'm sure you know, uh, uh, is a really actually a follow on from what the Lord has been speaking to us throughout the, our whole G12 conference uh, in, in August 2015. Okay? A new beginning, a new season, a new day. And it was such an awesome thing that to, to hear Pastor Lawrence uh, when he closed the conference as we celebrated our FCBC's 29th anniversary with that powerful word from the Lord that says, we need to go beyond, okay? Because we need to go beyond what we are used to, go beyond what we are, our usual comfort zones and our boundaries. This, I believe, is what the book of Acts is all about. And last weekend, Pastor Daniel started off and kicked off this whole series with a very first message on what does it mean to go beyond, okay? And he, he reminded us that first, we have to have a godly agenda, right? Versus a very one, one that is personal uh, uh, on our personal ambitions. Then he went on to tell us and challenge us that we need to have a divine perspective as a part to versus a worldly perspective. And finally, he said to us that we need to be spirit dependent and not just self-confident. I trust you have been following that message last week. And this week, we are going to go on into chapter 2. So if you have the Bibles with you, I'd like you now to turn to Acts chapter 2. We're not going to read the whole chapter. It's kind of long. We're just going to read verse 1 to verse 21. And then we're going to read verse 36 to 41. Okay, the, Just to catch the glimpse of what this whole chapter is all about. I'm sure this chapter is not unfamiliar to many of you. Because I believe it is a chapter that many of us would have read over and over again. Because it is the chapter that talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit. It is the chapter that reminds us that this is the place where the church was birthed. Okay? So let's turn to Acts chapter 2 and let's read verse 1 to verse 21 first. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't these who were speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each one of us hear them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Prigia and, and Pamphylia, Egypt and the other parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts of Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose it. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servant, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens and above the signs on the earth, below blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now we're going to read from verse 36 to verse 41. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord your God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this, his message 
were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Let us pray. Father, we want to thank you for this awesome story of your mighty work of the Holy Spirit. When you first came to visit us and now dwell among us. Father, we thank you for that empowerment that has birthed the church of Jesus Christ. And Lord, today, even as we read of this historical fact, Father, we know that we are but descendants and beneficiaries of this blessing. Father, we received it afresh again, thanking you again for your mighty works, thanking you again for all that you have done for each and every one of us, for the churches that have been birthed through the centuries and ages. And Lord, even today, to this very place and to this very church that you have brought us to. Father, we thank you. We honour you and we bless you. We pray, Father, tonight that as we fellowship over your word, as we share and talk, as we listen to your words to us, Father, I pray that you will meet each one of us at our unique point of need, Lord, whether here in Marine Parade or there in the Suntech Hall. Lord, may you speak to us in our own language and tongue. Lord, may you speak to us May we hear you. May we hear your Holy Spirit. May you lead and guide us. May you meet us at our unique point of need. Father, I pray again that the words from my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable before you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. For this weekend's message, as we enter into the book, as we enter into the chap- chapter 2 of the book of Acts, it is an exciting passage to preach from. It is like a, a preacher's dream, you know, where in one sense, if it can happen in the book of Acts in chapter 2, it can happen today. That means I can say anything I want here and you will hear it at your own language. And God's message will be for you. And I suspect and I pray tonight that this will be the case. I know I've prepared some things. I know I've prepared a word and I know I've prepared some, some messages, but I sense God is saying this to me even before I start. That whether you're at Suntech or here in Marine Parade, that even as I speak and the words that I say, many of you are going to receive words from the Lord that will be particularly for you, for you and you alone. You're going to hear it in one sense in a language that you understand. You're going to hear it in a language that, that, that will speak to your heart. And you're going to even see words and phrases and, 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 and hear things that, that may come even from this pulpit. But yet at the same time, it will go on to you personally. And so I'm excited. I'm excited about this weekend because, you know, this, this is a very significant moment in the, in, in the history of the church of Jesus Christ. It is about the coming of the promised Holy Spirit and the birth of the church here on this earth. It was a divine moment. In one sense, it was a going beyond moment when the Spirit was poured out and the church was birthed and the community was transformed. What a contrast, actually. What a contrast to Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, you will read, as you read, you will notice some tentativeness in the disciples. Many things had happened. They just lost their leader. They, although they saw him alive, they saw him resurrected, they were told that, that this is not time yet. They were told to stay quiet for a while and wait. In fact, the same authorities and the same people that arrested their master were still around. And they were not sure whether they would go next. Yes, things were not exactly in the best of times. And I do believe that there was such an uncertainty and fear even in their heart. So what happened then? What happened in chapter 2 that made all the difference? What changed the climate? What, what was the going beyond moment? If you remember Pastor Kong's message about what it means to go beyond, he says, every miracle of God seemed to always have a beyond factor. And it is often also has a period of what he calls a beyond struggle. But then there will come a moment, there will come a time, a beyond moment where faith arises, a clear decision or action is taken to respond to God. And from that moment on, things begin to roll for God's purposes and for God's glory. I believe Acts chapter 2 was such a going beyond moment. I believe we saw in, in the, I believe the whole of X2 is actually one big moment. You see, 
writing the writings, the text and everything it has its limitations because when you write words like that, there is a, a, a there is a is assumed linear structure and sequential uh, uh, description of the, the things that happened in Acts chapter 2. But if you read carefully as what is going on, actually there were many things that were going on. So even as Luke tried to document what was going on, he was probably documenting things that were going on all, over, all around together because the Word of God says they heard it in their own language, which means that all of them, all the disciples were probably speaking at the same time. And so in one sense, the whole of Acts chapter 2 is what I call a divine moment. The whole of Acts chapter 2 is what I call a going beyond moment. And indeed, it was a poignant one. Because it ended up with the fact that when Peter preached his sermon, you know how long that sermon was? As it is, if it was verbatim, three minutes. <laughs> we, pre we preached too long here in our church actually. <laughs> what I did was I read through and I, I timed myself and I said, Peter, he, he only did three minutes actually. And with that three minute sermon, he ended up with the fact that the people were cut to the heart. Wow. You know, as preachers, we want to say, wow, we'll be able to preach and cut to the heart. But you know, that's not us. That's really the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cut to the heart. And so there was a poignant going beyond moment um, there where the Holy Spirit was poured out, brought conviction, repentance, and commitment. Let's read Acts chapter 2, verse 36, 38 again. I want to read it again because I want you to capture that poignant time where the message cut to the heart. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There you have it. This is what I would call, and I believe, just as the coming of the Holy Spirit came, was poured out onto the, onto the, onto the disciples, apostles, as they were gathered in that room, and even as they stood out, out there in the streets, beginning to preach the Word of God, this was that going beyond moment. Well, is this somewhere we are right now even? We are also living in interesting and exciting times, even in our nation. We are in a season of change. Things are changing. Even as a nation, right? If you can remember, we just in one sense celebrated or, or, or concluded, or not really concluded yet. They say that by December they're going to finally conclude. But our past National Day was like our conclusion uh, as we celebrated our 50th birthday, a jubilee year. We are into a whole new beginning as a nation. New government, we just had our elections, new cabinet, new ministers, and, and, and many of us too, I suspect. New families, new, new relationships, new jobs. Therefore, I do believe that we are, this, this word for us in this season is really, really important. And I want to encourage you to meditate on it. Isaiah 43, verse 19. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Every time I read this scripture, I, I'm just caught up with the imagery of, of, of a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Two images that somehow, somehow contradict and, and somehow can never be in our natural eyes see. But yet this is how God works. God wants to do new things that we have never seen before. God wants to do, do new things in our lives that we have never uh, perceived before. And I believe we are in that kind of a season. But you know, as new beginnings unfold before us, new frontiers, new lands, new faces, new focuses, new fears, new anxieties even, and I believe there are new great unknowns even. I sense that the stresses on us, even as a society, as a nation, is even higher. You know why? We've been overblessed. And because of that, we've accumulated much. And because of much of what we have accumulated, it is very understandable that, that many will prefer what I call the status quo. Don't rock the boat. Isn't it? Why? Because we have already had a lot. But yet I hear that the situation out there is not 
any better. More and more I'm hearing about the fact that people are finding it difficult to get a job. More and more I'm hearing people saying that Singapore is in a, technically in a recession now. We even hear, and, if, and so even as we hear the call to go to the ends of the earth, to go beyond, I believe there are so many of us who sit here very concerned, with concerns in our hearts, whether we can even make it. But yet at the same time, we know we cannot look back. Just like the apostles in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2. So as with all the disciples, they had to make a decision to wait on the Lord. But you know, what's exciting is this. It is exactly in such a, great, uh, 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 such a difficult time that in one sense you will find your greatest breakthrough. You will find the birth and the foundation of the church. You will find the fearful to become the fearless. You will find the, those who were aimless that became purposeful. You will find those who have been dispersed in hiding, coming out into the front line of ministry and community. So listen carefully to what Peter says. He says in verse 14, listen carefully to what I say. And if you go back tonight and read through again his, his sermon, he comes to one simple, very crucial verse in verse 21. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, there's so much power in that scripture. There's so much power in these words. It simply means, yes, it's as it is. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's why when you visit a friend in hospital, when you visit a friend who is sick, when you visit a, a colleague or a relative who is not well, who is in great need, you can say to them with great confidence, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved be safe. In Love Singapore, we have this tagline that says, God's greatest glory through a life change, a church revive, a nation transform, and a world evangelize. That has always been a passion of Pastor Kong and FCBC. As we are part of the Love Singapore movement, as we believe God for this nation, we believe that this is God's greatest glory to see lives change, to see a church revive, a nation transform, and a world reach for Jesus Christ. So the question I want to answer this weekend as we go through the book of Acts, and Acts chapter 2, is this question. What does it take to see revival in the church and transformation in the city? What does it take to see revival in the church and transformation in the city? What I call a going beyond moment. I know some of you say, Pastor, wow, wow, this, this, this question is for all the pastors and all the church leaders to answer. Well, let me personalize this for you. What does it take to see revival and transformation in your own life? Because as each and every one receive revival in our hearts, revival in our spirit, as each and every one of us get transformed by God's Holy Spirit and power, I believe you and I can be part of this transforming process. And that's how God works. God works through you. God works through your cell group. God works through your family. God works. And, and I believe today, and I believe this weekend, this is the word and this is the, the, the word for us to receive. Lord, what does it take for you to transform us? What does it take for you to revive us so that we can see our nation transform for you and for your purpose? Lord, help us Help us to enter into what I call the going beyond moment. So in Acts chapter 2, I see three things that will happen when God's people stand united and in agreement. Call upon the name of the Lord and we will see revival and transformation in our church and in our city. We'll see revival in our, in our lives, in our families. We'll see revival in our homes and our cell groups. I believe these are the three things that will happen and we stand together, calling out to God in agreement for this. So what is it? Number one, what does it take to see revival in the church and transformation in our city? Number one, we will recognize the visitation of the presence of God. We will recognize the visitation of the presence of God. 
Jesus is Lord. I'm sure by now you know that reading Acts chapter 2, one of the most important and most significant moments on this whole record for us of, God, of, of church history is the coming and outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So let's read verse 1 and verse 4 again. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Make no bones about it, okay? Acts 1.8 says this, And you will receive power. Right? So the only way that we're going to receive power is to receive the power from the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit brings power to the church of Christ. Power to the body of Christ. And that's what it did. When the Holy Spirit came on that unique day, He empowered the church. It was as if it was like a prophetic exercise for me last night. Because last night I had to go for a touch community service official event. So I drove my car from my home right up to Changi, okay? And as I started my car from home, I told my wife, I said, oh, oh, the engine sounds a bit not so good. Well, thank God. I drove all the way to the function place. I parked the car at the parking lot that they gave me. And then I tried to adjust my car because I was a little bit crooked. I put my key in, turn on the thing, my car was dead. The battery went dead. Okay. Thank God there were people there that were able to help me. And um, I managed to get my battery replaced while the function was going on. And by the time I finished, I came back to the car. I had a brand new battery and everything was there and ready to go. And as I thought about that whole thing, it reminded me of what I was going to preach this evening. God says, some of you need a new battery. Some of you need a new battery replacement and that battery, that power needs to come from the Holy Spirit. Because you've been running on your own battery, you've been running on your own power, you've been running on your own steam. And God says, I want to give you a new battery. I want you to be aware that the power that I give can only come from one source and that is the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. That's why we need to recognize His visitation and His presence. I remember Pastor Gil preaching this word to us. He says, do we and I recognize the presence of the Lord when He's here? Well, let's look at verse 2 and those couple of verses there in Acts chapter 2. Let's see what happens when there is a visitation of His presence. Firstly, you will notice this word, Suddenly. Suddenly, it, it, in one sense, it can come from anywhere. Well, that's how God moves and that's how the Holy Spirit moves. Sometimes in one, in one sense, in the most unexpected way. But the point is this, are you ready? Are you anticipating it? Are you catching it? Because suddenly, God can come. And of course, if we are found in places and uh, doing things that are not good, then suddenly He comes. I'm sure He's going to catch you, okay? Well, anyway, okay. <laughs> Then there will be a sound. There will be a sound. In fact, if you talk to people who have documented revivals, they keep on talking about this fact that in every revival, there's a record of the fact that there is a fresh sound of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that's what's happening too. Our worship, our worship and, and, and the worship around the world, you're going to see a new sound when God's revival begin to come true. And it's something that you and I can recognize. Then you will notice that the Holy Spirit, when He comes, can come also like a violent rushing wind or blowing of a violent wind. Many scholars have interpreted this just to, just to say that when the Holy Spirit comes, He comes with power. He just doesn't come like a, he wants a timid little breeze. There's a power that will be there that can actually move people. There's a power that can, that can actually uh, cause, bring life to things that are not, not alive. The Holy Spirit is a power that can move. Then you will notice that the Holy Spirit can fill a whole house. 
which means this is it, something that, that all of us can experience as a community. It's not just one person or just one person say, oh, I, I, I received the Holy Spirit and the rest of you don't have. No, no, when He comes, He will bless the community. There's always a blessing for the community. And then you will notice too, it says, it comes as a tongue of fire. In this particular instance, the Holy Spirit was visible was visible to everyone who saw them and they could see it as if it was a spirit descending upon the disciples. I believe God wants us to know that you need to keep your eyes open. That's all. When the Holy Spirit moves, keep your eyes open. Because you see, if you want to recognize the Spirit moving, you cannot have your eyes shut. That's why we teach you in spiritual warfare training, right? Pray with your eyes open. You know, I can't help but as I was preparing this, remembering uh, a seminar that I attended uh, uh, a couple of years back where, where Eric Johnson, you know Bill Johnson's son? He was, he was teaching. And, and he was talking about how they really teach their members to move in the power of the Spirit. And so he says there was one young Christian in their church and, and this guy decided to sign up for a, a, a mission trip. And so they sent him on a mission trip to Africa. And so this timid guy, he says, wow, you mean I can pray for people? I said, yeah, they say, you go and pray for people. So, so they sent him forward during the ministry time to pray for somebody. And he found himself standing in front of him. And this person came up to him. The boy had no arms. With only two stumps on his thing and, and asked him to pray. So this guy freaked out. He says, hey, you know, my first case of praying for a ministry will come with this guy with two, no arms. What do you want me to do? So, so, so Eric Johnson said, this guy closed his eyes put out his hands and then did all his best just pray, 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 and say, God, heal him now, and, and, and do something to him. As he was closing his eyes, boom, something hit his head. Right? He thought something fell from the roof. He opened his eyes, two arms came out. And the two arms hit his face, you see. And from that day on, that young man learned a very important lesson. Don't close your eyes when you pray. But we laugh about it. But when I heard it, I said, wow. I don't mind that happening to me, even if my eyes are closed. But what an awesome sight that God can move. God can move. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, many of us know that there is a, a, a flow of God's Spirit in, in, in different strengths, in one sense, in, in, in different places. And, and, and that team saw that. And I've been saying, Lord, I want to see that happen too. I believe, God, you're the same Holy Spirit that works. And indeed, you can cause arms to be extended where there were no arms. That's why one of the important things as we note in, this, in Acts 2 is that in Acts chapter 2, verse 8, it says this, Then how is it that each one of us hear them in our own native language? One of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit's moving in this very first occasion was the fact that there were gathered people from different nations and different nations, different nations and tribes. And everyone with different languages and every one of them somehow they heard it in their same language. Personally, I've been praying for this gift for a long time, especially when I go to China because you know I can't speak Mandarin. I always say, God, help me speak in English and then they hear it in Mandarin, okay? Right? <laughs> but you know, in verse 12 and verse 13, I want to highlight to you a very interesting observation. Verse 12 says this, amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? And it's those who heard it, they heard the message, they were amazed. They said, oh, God is moving. They want to run out. Now, verse 13, interestingly says, some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. I want to show you that there were two kinds of responses when the Holy Spirit moves. One, especially for those who are what called foreigners, non-church people. In fact, it always seemed to happen that way. The non-church people actually appreciate the move of God much more than the church people. You see, the people that really complained were the Jews, you know. The people that complained says, how can these people, uh, you know, they must be drunk. Because you see, they were Jews and, and they were hearing, they were not hearing right. Whereas the foreigners, they came not expecting anything. They heard the messages in their own tongue. And so they were blessed, they received it. 
But the, the, the so-called church people, the Jews over at that time, you know, they said, how can it be? I believe within it, there is always pride. Because you say, well, you Jew, I Jew. Why can you, why it can happen to you, cannot happen to me. You know, that kind of thing. So, so, so I think there's a lot of pride in them. Why you, not me? But it takes a lot of humility to receive and know the works of God. It takes a lot of humility to be willing to receive and hear it in our own tongue. That's why on a weekend when you hear a message from push from this pulpit or in our church, I hope you come with an attitude saying, Lord, I want to receive. I want to hear it in my own tongue. And I believe that if you come with that attitude, God will speak to you. Regardless of whether you are uh, uh, one that's t- totally uh, 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 stressed out with many of your problems or one that's just coming because you want to enjoy God's presence, I believe God will speak. I don't care whether you have one says, big problems or small problems, God will speak to you where you are. But all He calls for us is this. We learn to come with humility of heart and willing to hear the Word in our own language and tongue. That's why I'm excited for this weekend because I really, really sense in my heart that God is speaking to many of you right now, even in Suntech right now. You're hearing things from the Lord, hearing things even beyond my words. You're hearing things from the Lord and the Lord is speaking to many of you, giving you messages, giving you words. And you say, yes, that's for me, that's for me. Matthew 5, 8 says this, Blessed are the pure in heart. What do they say? For they will see God. God. That's why you notice the people who grumble usually don't see God. The people who complain usually don't see God. It is those with a pure in heart, they will see God. Jeremiah 29, one of my favourite chapters in the Bible. Verse 11 to 14, many of us know some of these verses by heart. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Oh, we all claim that. But then, look at verse 12. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. Look at verse 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you. In one sense, God saying to you, even in places where you think you are in exile, even if you feel like you're in the wrong place, Seek God with the right heart and He will speak to you. When you seek me, you will find me. When you seek me with all your heart. That's why, how can you recognize the presence of the Lord? How can you recognize the presence of the Lord? Come to the Lord with a heart that is right. And that's why you and I can recognize the visitation of the presence of God when our hearts are open and pure before Him. That's why Revelation 3.20 says this, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. This is a simple instruction. You want to recognize the presence of God? Open the door of your heart and He will come in. A couple of months ago, I heard a very... Wonderful testimony from one of our other teams and that is from Pastor Jenny Ong's team. She has got this cell group that they have that are more the elderly Mandarin speaking type. And so because for that, they try to, in one sense, when they do their prayer tower assignments, they say, well, this one, older people, try not to give them the midnight graveyard shift, you know, the 12 p midnight to 4 a.m. one, okay? So they were doing, trying to avoid that for this group. But one day, the cell leader and the aunties all decide that, hey, they want to give it a try. They want to give it a try. They said, okay, assign us. So, so they, they got assigned in March to one of those slots from 12 midnight to 4 a.m. Okay? So they all came. They all came to TC and they went to the coffee shop. Then before the prayer tower time, they were sitting in the coffee shop. They were talking Wow, how to tahan the four hours, ah, you know. They, they've never done it before and, 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 and they're all a, a group of older ladies and elderly ladies and they said, you know, but they all turned up. And so the G12 leader heard their, their concerns. So when they went into the prayer tower, the G12 leader says, don't worry, we're going to worship the Lord and we'll just let the Holy Spirit speak to you and let Him do what He wants to do. Just enjoy the Holy Spirit. 
So he got, she got all the aunties to be on the floor, okay? And they were kneeling and they said, why don't we just worship and just ask God, okay, to, 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 to show us his presence. And then the, the G12 leader, because she, she had to be assigned to, to, to pray for senior pastors, so, so she went to uh, the corner to pray for senior pastors. So, so that group of old ladies were just there, okay? And they were just praying and praying in tongues. They said, okay, pray in tongues first, okay? So they go ahead, pray in tongues. Now, after a while, suddenly the Holy Spirit fell on one of them. And she started to laugh uncontrollably, okay? And she rolled down onto the floor, okay, right? And then the other old lady started to catch the same Holy Spirit. And she started, they started to laugh and they rolled down the floor and they went on and on and on. And it went on for three hours. <laughs> and when it finished, when it got up, they said, wow, pray out over in here. <laughs> They were so excited. They said, oh, can come again. They can come again. So, so they volunteered again. They can come back again. But, but the point is this. When you come with that simplicity of heart to be open to the Holy Spirit to use you, to visit you, God will come through. God will come through. And that's what this means. So if you and I want to see revival in the church and transformation in the city, if you and I want to see that, when we must recognize the visitation of the presence of the Lord. Because Jesus is Lord and He is Lord. He is Lord over all situations. That's why when Peter preached his sermon, he, he said, hey guys, let me tell you, what you're seeing is what the prophets have written over and over again. And they've said this, that's going to happen. And this is what they say. Joel said this and da-da-da. And, and, and David says this in this psalm. And this is what's happening. And today, you are witnessing the very fact that Jesus is the Son of God that came. And this is what happens because Jesus is Lord. So come with your eyes open, open your hearts and allow God to work. That's how we can recognize the visitation of the presence of God. So that's the first thing. Okay? What does it take to see revival in the church and transformation in our city? Recognize the visitation of the presence of God. Number two, receive the revelation of the truth of God. Jesus is Saviour. Receive the revelation of the truth of God. Jesus is Savior. This is what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, He says in John 15, 26, When the advocate comes, whom I send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, He will testify about me, about Jesus. This is what I call the one important test of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit always points to Jesus. The Holy Spirit always points to Jesus. John 16, 13 says this, But when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak of His own. He will speak only what He hears and He will tell you what is yet to come. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And of course, John 14 says, 14, 6 says this. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, beyond the signs and wonders, we need to speak and preach the truth of the Word of God. We need to preach and teach the truth of Jesus. That was what Peter did. When Peter stood up before the eleven, he said, listen carefully to what I have to say to you. If you look at his whole three-minute sermon and go back and dissect it and look through it, everything in that sermon points to Jesus. Everything in that sermon, he says, this is what the Holy Spirit is doing right now. He came here and the reason he's doing it is because he says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And then he goes on to present not just the prophetic evidence, but the historical evidence of who Jesus is. Because they have recently just experienced this, this great thing that happened in their city. Jesus was cru crucified and they saw the, uh, the, the evidence of the, the resurrection and they know that Jesus has risen from the dead. And every claim that Jesus has made has come true. You know, once in a while, I, 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 I myself miss and forget this truth. And that is this. That the Bible that you and I hold in our hand is not a mystical book. It is a historical document. 
And everything that's in there is, can be historically verified. And that's the difference of our faith. We don't serve a mystical faith. Our faith is not mystical. It is historical and true. And that's why when, when, when Peter took on, in one sense, the microphone, when, when he, he, he got up to preach that very first Pentecost message, all he did was simply do this. He says, let me show you the Word of God. And that's where he quoted all the prophets and all the Psalms. And then he says, let me then tell you what happened in this city just a few months back. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you crucified. And he now is risen from the dead. That's why in Acts chapter 2, verse 23, verse 24, you, see, you hear him say this, This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Then in verse 32 and verse 33, it says this, But God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. You see how Peter put it all together? You know, he put his message and his sermon together so beautifully. He says, let me tell you this is what happened. You notice this Holy Spirit now? You notice this miraculous thing that's going on? This, this supernatural thing that you're hearing people in their own tongues and all? But let me tell you the other fact, the documented fact of this is this. There is a prophet, prophecy given about Jesus and it's happening right now, right here, and this is what's, what you're experiencing. And then after that, he uses a psalm and he quoted David and psalm and he says, this is what the record shows and I want you to know that this is the Jesus that you crucified. Can you imagine you're the first time preacher standing out in front of people and saying, this is the Jesus you crucified. I tell you, he went straight to the point and sometimes truth hurts. That's why tonight, even if you sit here, for some of you, when you hear Peter mention, say this in these verses, I hope you also understand that these verses apply to us too. That it was because of our sin. It was because of our sinfulness, we crucified Jesus. And that's why in one sense we need a saviour. You know, you might have heard this shared with you quite a few times before, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the pivotal kingpin, linchpin of our faith. And on that hinges everything else. And I dare say it true, it is true. If you can disprove the resurrection, then you'll disprove Christianity. But let me tell you, for the last 2,000 years, nobody has done it. In fact, some people say that maybe the, 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 the Roman authorities have, have, uh, uh, was, was the one that could hide the body. Well, if they did, they could have produced it even those few days and to demonstrate the fact that Jesus was dead. They didn't do that. Some people say that maybe the disciples have hidden the body or, or, or hid it somewhere just to claim that he has arisen. Well, think of all that the disciples went through. Think of all that the apostles went through. Do you think that these people would have risked their lives for a lie? No way. But the very fact of truth is this. There was power in the Holy Spirit and there was the evidence of the Word of God and the truth of God. So that's why sometimes people say truth hurts. And it is indeed true. You and I put Jesus on the cross. That's why this part of Peter's message was really, was in this part of Acts chapter 2, was really to bring his audience or bring the people that he was speaking to to a place where they finally say, I need a saviour. Because there's no other way that they can get out of it. And there's no other way you and I can get out of it. Do you know the Ten Commandments? What does the Ten Commandments say? You shall not lie. How many of you have told a lie before? You shall not steal. I'm sure some of us have stolen a little cup of coupon here and there. Okay? <laughs> have you looked into another woman with lust in your eyes? Because the Bible says that's adultery. Have you used God's name in vain? 
I suspect if many of us were to meet God tonight, I suspect many of us may not be able to answer these questions too well. That's why, in one sense, Peter brought his people to that place where he finally says, you crucified Christ, you are the one that put him to death. But let me tell you this, he is not just Lord, he is your Messiah. That's why verse 36 for me is, in one sense, like the key verse of Acts chapter 2. Because it says this, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. If you want to use another word for the word Messiah, you can use the word Saviour. You see, Jesus is not just Lord, He is Saviour. I know often we preach the fact that, yeah, many of us receive Jesus as our Saviour, but we don't make Him as Lord. Well, that's also true. But the point we're making is this, is that sometimes we forget that the fact is that He is our Saviour and we need Him to save us. And the life that you and I have today, the life that you and I live today, is on the basis of the fact that He saved us. Now, that's a big, big difference there. And that's why I take verse 36 as a key word in this message this weekend. And that is that we need, you and I need to come to that place where not only is Jesus Lord, you need to come to that place and know that Jesus is Saviour. Because you see, Jesus responds to the faith that we put in Him as our Saviour. I always remember this funny story about a man who was walking by the roadside of a mountain and as he fell, suddenly he tripped off the cliffside and as he was rolling down, he grabbed her one little branch. And then he shouted, he said, God, help me, help me. If you're there, save me. And suddenly God spoke. He says, yes, I'm here. I will save you. Oh God, so good to hear. Tell me what to do. God says, let go. The man talked for a while and says, is anybody else out there? <laughs> you see, sometimes we choose to have Jesus as Lord and we do not trust Him as Saviour. That's why I love this beautiful song that I used to sing when I was a kid. And tonight I thought I will just sing it to you just to let you know that there are some very simple, powerful songs out there that we now don't sing actually. It goes something like this. Jesus is a wonderful Saviour. He will carry you through. Jesus is a wonderful Saviour. He will carry you through. Hallelujah. Jesus is a wonderful Saviour. He will carry you through until the battle's done and the victory is won. My Lord will carry you through, oh my precious brother. When the world's on fire, you need my Jesus to be your Savior. He'll hide you ever in the rock of ages, in the rock of ages, just cleft for you. You know, I didn't sing it just in one sense to get you to clap, but I sung that because I felt as I was preparing this word, I really felt that word, that, that this was going to be a ministry to some of you. To know that Jesus is indeed a wonderful, not just Lord, but Saviour. And I suspect some of you are in dire states today. Some of you might be in problems today. Some of you might be in great, great trouble today. And all, on, all counts, and on all counts and on all measures, you know that you cannot make it. That's why it's important for you to know that today God says, the, the Peter says in verse 36, God has made this Jesus both Lord and Saviour. And I pray today that you will call out to Him and know that He will respond to the faith and the trust that you put in Him. You know, when Jesus looked at the blind man and says, what do you want me to do for you? You know, when Jesus did that, you know what He was converting? He was converting the need of that blind man into faith. Because you see, the blind man would say, Jesus, hey, you are the son of God. You know what? I'm blind. Definitely I want to see. 
But when that blind man turned around and said, Jesus, I want to see. His second time when he says this in front of Jesus, it is no longer a statement of need. It is a statement of faith. That he believes that this Jesus that is before him will save him and that he can trust. That's why God needs to bring us through this journey. That's why God needs to bring us through it. If we want to see revival in the church, we want to see revival in our own lives, we want to see transformation in the city, we want to see transformation in our own lives, not only are we to recognize the visitation of His presence, we need to receive the revelation of His truth. And the truth is, Jesus is our wonderful Savior. Finally, what does it take to see revival in the church and transformation in our city? We need to Return with repentance to the love of God. We need to return with repentance to the love of God. Finally, finally, it is about responding to God's love. And tonight I want to say to all of us, it's as simple as A, B, C. First, accept His love. Believe in His love. And see, confess that Jesus is Lord and Savior. That's as simple as that. That's why when Peter was asked, what must we do? Let's look at verse 37 to verse 39. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What was Peter's reply? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord your God will call. The simple truth is simply this. All you need to do is repent and be baptized. That's all. A few months ago, I was at a conference and I was listening to a missionary speak. He shared a short devotion and, and as he shared, he made a very powerful point. He said that he lived a lifestyle of personal evangelism and he does a lot of sharing of the gospel and therefore, everywhere he goes, he, he shares the gospel and many people come to know the Lord through his ministry and through his work. And over the years, he has got many, many people who have come to know the Lord. Then once in a while, he would revisit the land or the places that he has gone to and the people that he has shared the gospel with. And when he gone back to them and he, and he realized this, that some of them have fallen away. But some of them are fervent still in the faith and walking the life of discipleship, walking the life of following Christ. And he asked himself, God, why? Why is it so? They all receive the same gospel. They all receive the same gospel. Why is it that one goes away and are strong for you and why one still falls away? And he says, the more he researched this and the more he thought this through, he began to realize the reality of what Paul said in Acts 20 verse 21. I have declared to both Jews and Greek that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. What he said was this. He said, he said, I realize this, that the ones that stay, the ones that finally stay on in discipleship, the ones that finally believe God was because when I shared the gospel with them, they repented. They repented about their life, their sins and all. The ones that say, oh yeah, good, I like Jesus to save my sins and with that, they just repent because they have a good life. And because of that, those, the, the, the level of their salvation, the level of their faith was shallow. And that's why when the birds came, they would take away that faith. But for the one that repented, for the one that says, God, I know my life is a sinner. I know I shouldn't have been like this. I know I need you. And this is the only thing I can do. I can do is repent. These are the ones that stay strong and stay connected with the Lord. And that's why in, in Singapore, we do have a problem you see, we live a life that our lives and our, 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 the, the, the blessings of this nation is tremendous. We don't have to worry about water, lights and air conditioning and things like that. And that's why I suspect sometimes our faith also becomes like that. We do have an air conditioned type of faith. And that's why I believe we all need to return to this truth again. And that is that we must repent. Repent to the love of God. 
And so what this missionary said in his presentation was this. He says, you know, for people like us here, you must know how to challenge them to repent. And the thing that they repent for is not about the fact that they are drug addict or not the fact that they were bad people. They need to just repent for the fact that they had thought they could live life on their own. They need to repent of the fact that they thought they could have the perfect pure life. They need to repent for the fact that they forgot that God needs to be their, help, their saviour. We need to get everybody to that place of repentance because until you can get to that place of repentance, will you be able to understand and appreciate and know the love of God. Wow, when I heard that message that day, I was cut. And I realised the truth that when I share the gospel too, I must not share just on the fact that God is a good new blessing for you. But it is true that unless you and I have the, 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 the gospel of Jesus in our heart, the Holy Spirit within us, we are doomed. We are doomed for death and nothing can matter and nothing can make it except for the love of God. And that's why we need to live a life of repentance that each day we repent before God for thinking that we can go our own way. That's why there's an urgency in this message. There's an urgency in this message because you know why? God says, the title of this message says what? There's a going beyond moment. That means we can miss it, you know. We can miss this moment and miss this opportunity. I remember this story told to me about a man who lived somewhere in Marine Parade. He lives on the 10th floor and as one day he was looking out of his window and as he was looking out of his window, suddenly he dropped his watch. And as he dropped his watch, he quickly got out of his house, ran down the staircase. As he ran down the staircase, he was trying to go down right to the bottom to catch the watch as he fell. <laughs> and as he was running down, his neighbour, he bumped into his neighbour, his neighbour asked him, what are you doing, sir? He said, oh, I just dropped my watch. And he's going down and I'm going to run down there to try and catch it. I had a neighbor laugh at him and says, How can you get there? By the time you get there, it will smash the ground already. It will be broken to pieces. This man turned to me and said, Ayah, sir, you don't understand my watch. It's always 15 minutes late. <laughs> I love this story because it makes us laugh, but yet at the same time, it has a very powerful truth behind it. Because you see, sometimes many of us live our lives always 15 minutes late. And it's not just about being late for a function or late for an event. We can be late for life. We can be late for God's timing. We can be late for God's purposes. And we can even be late for what God intends for us. That's why in my ministry, in my work, one of the most heartbreaking times is to see the sad faces of parents who come to me and say, with disappointment in their faces that says, how can you help me deal with my rebellious teenager? Is it too late for us and too late for him? I hear lament from friends who come to me and say, well, after so many years, I think I've missed the growing up of my children. I've seen also the sad faces of husbands and wives who come to us because their marriages have been broken because of neglect. And they ask and they regret and they say, is it too late? Is it too late? I've seen also the regrets on faces of business owners and CEOs and big time business owners and say, you know, they've given all their lives and climbing the corporate ladder and to find that the ladder is leaning on the wrong wall. Or business owners that finally says, I built up a corporate empire and finally realize that everything is just a piece of paper. You see, it's one thing to be late for an event or a ball, but it's another to be late for God. That's why I want to challenge many of you tonight. God is on the move. That's why when God brought that first Pentecost or that first move of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, I believe since then He has been on the move. In fact, I believe He's on the move even more in Singapore. Because there's a very unique call for God, of God in our nation. And I want to challenge many of you to just wake up. And I believe God wants to wake up many of us today to know that fact that He is on the move. 
And that the new beginning that God wants to give to us is a new beginning in the Holy Spirit. And I tell you what is the wonderful promise. Look at verse 39. The wonderful promise is this. When He gives us the Holy Spirit, it says, this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. That means tonight, if you receive and give, receive again afresh the move of the Holy Spirit in your life and what God has done for you, this promise is not just for you, but it will be for your children and for all who are afar. That means even for the people who come. You see, the fact that if you walk with God, if you are revived with God, if you get transformed by God, by the Holy Spirit, then this blessing is not just for you. This blessing will go to the community and the people around you. I close with this final story. Recently, I had a wonderful privilege. As many of you know, I teach at FCBS as part of the pastoral staff team. And every year, we got different batches that come on and all. And, and this year, there's a nice batch and, and I got to know quite a fair bit of them because one of the projects that I do with them is that they got a lot of assignments from me and they don't quite like me because of that. Anyway, okay. But in that opportunity, I got them to do some projects and in one group that came up with a project, I was so, so touched by one of the testimonies of one of our FCBS members. His name is Mr. Eric Lim, and I'm sure he doesn't mind me sharing the story. He grew up most of his life fighting for himself and in one sense built up a business that was so big. He was in the shipyard business. He said at one time in his life, every six months he had a new car. Because whatever new model came up, he had to have it and he was able to have it. So he was living that kind of life, high life, and with that, he neglected his family, neglected his wife, his children and all, and continued to think that the world is at his business. Well, on the 23rd of July, 2008, at 3.30 p.m., he was visiting one of the shipyards, and he was climbing up a staircase, and he fell six meters from that staircase. As he fell, he broke C4 to C7 of his spinal cord. His spinal cord broke into four parts. And that resulted in him completely being immobilized and incapacitated. He said the only thing that could work at that point of time was only his brains, because he could think still. He said his pair of eyes, because he could see. His two ears, he could hear, and nothing else. Everything else, he had to be tube fed, looked into and no function at all. No other function of his body. He said this was when he knew that it was better to be dead than alive. And he went on like that and with all the surgery and everything, the surgeons gave him, he says, at best, when you recover, your life will be always in a wheelchair. He was so helpless, depressed, dis despairing that he says, he couldn't even kill himself because he was totally lying there, bedridden. He couldn't even move a finger or a toe. He laid in bed for many months and finally he was discharged. He still had to go home and they sent him home. While that was going on, while he was incapacitated like that, his business was crashing, his partner swindled everything that they had. Uh, the, the MOM came to him for all his foreign workers and all his, he had to sell everything that he had, his car, his properties and all to repay all the debts that he was found himself in while he was still in that state. Well, one day his sister-in-law came to visit him, who is a Christian, and shared the gospel with him. And he says, in his dead state, with that simple faith, he says, I believe and accepted Jesus. The sister-in-law brought a pastor and all the seven members to visit him frequently and they prayed for him. And after that day, he says, I constantly pray every day, at least 30 to 50 times, say, God, heal me, heal me. If you heal me a little bit, I will give you the rest of my life. Well, guess what? Four months later, after he accepted Christ, his toes started to move. 
three months later, after that, he started to, his, his feelings came back to his legs and he started taking a few small steps. Today, Eric is able to attend FCBS for the last four months. His relationship with his wife, his family has all been restored. He says, now I don't care about anything else. He says, now I, only, I don't have a car. He says, I got only BMW, bus, MRT and walk. <laughs> and he's now passionate about living life. He's now a cell leader. And I think if those of you at GTEL conference, you caught the, the part where he was on stage. He was interviewed. He's the one that started his cell with two members. And now he got 15 members. Because he say he's been sharing his life about the fact that when God saved him, God saved him, God saved him. And he's a walking testimony of the power of God's love and grace. I don't know about you, but when I heard that story, I just told myself, wow, God, you really love us in such a very unique and special way. Thank God for Eric. Thank God for his life right now. And he's now standing up and he, he wants to make his testimony a testimony that many of us can be encouraged with and know that this is what God can do for you. What will happen when God revives us? What will happen when the community is revived? What will happen when the community is transformed? Let's read verse 43 to verse 47. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give up to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and were at together and were glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. This is a picture of a transformed community. This is a picture of transformed lives in a transformed community. This is a picture of a revived person in a revived church, in a revived faith community. What does it take to see revival in church and in transformation in our city? First, we need to recognize the visitation of the presence of the Lord. Number two, we need to receive the revelation of the truth of God. And finally, we need to return with repentance to the love of God. I know I cannot close this service tonight without giving a special invitation to those of you who are here, whether in Suntec or in Marine Parade. Maybe you've been in church for a few times or been visiting other churches too but you've never had that opportunity to give your life to Jesus. So in a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And tonight, I want to plead with you. There's an urgency about tonight. There's an urgency about this moment because this is a going beyond moment for you. And if you make and choose to make this decision for the Lord and to say, just like Eric, there's nothing else I can live for now except to give my life to you. Lord, you can turn it around. You can change it. You can transform it. You can cause my little toes to move again so that I can live for you. I want to make this plea. I want to make this plea because I believe tonight there are many here that you are going to, you, you do not know where you will be if tomorrow your life is taken from you. And I want to come to you straight off and encourage you do don't let this moment go by. Our God is a God of love. He loves you deeply. That's why He loves you so deeply that He allows us to bring a word of such a nature. Share a story like Eric to just choke us up again. To realize that although we think we got life in our hands, but really no one can guarantee. Today, would you give your life to Jesus? Would you give your life to Him? The Holy Spirit is speaking to you in your own language. You know it. In fact, many of you are hearing it in your own dialect even. Because that's how the Holy Spirit works. 
He will speak to you in your heart language. So regardless of what I say today, I believe the Spirit has already moved. Whether you're sitting right up there in the corner or way up there in the other part of Suntec City, God is saying to you, tonight is the night. Tonight is the night. God wants to revive you. God wants to transform you. Recognize His presence here. Know that He is the God of truth. And just give your life in repentance to Him. Would you pray with me? Would you pray with me? Let us bow our heads right now. All over the auditorium, from here as well as in Sunday City. I would like to encourage our brothers and sisters who are with, who, who are with us in, in, in FCBC. You're, you're a believer. I want you to pray this prayer along with our friends too. Let's join them because this is a crucial moment for them. This is a going beyond moment that God wants to do and work in their lives. So let's pray with them. Let's believe God for them. Let's exercise our faith too to know that they, tonight, will give their life to Jesus. So pray along with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe Jesus died for my sins. And rose from the dead. And rose from the dead. I turn from my sins. I turn from my sins. I repent from my sins. I repent from my sins. I invite you to come into my life. I invite you to come. I want to trust and follow you. I want to trust and follow you. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. While every head is still bowed and every eye is still closed, you do not have to lift up your head, whether here or in Suntec City. I want to pray a blessing for you because you have made the most awesome and fantastic decision of your life. To know that you need a Savior and He's here to save you. And you have prayed that prayer for the very first time in your heart. You know that this is the first time. Then when I come to three, would you just quickly just lift up your right hand? You don't have to lift up your head. You don't have to open up your eyes. Just lift it up so that I can see your hand and I can pray a blessing for you. And also there in Santa City, the pastors there will also be stretching their hands towards you and I will pray for you too, even as I pray through the screen. I believe God is there for you too. If you have prayed that prayer for the very first time, friend, please accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. And even if you have not prayed that prayer but you know that in your heart you want to, then lift your hand up right now. One, two, three. Lift it up high. Lift it up high. Lift it up high. Still up high. Okay, I can't see any, but Santex Lee. Yeah. Father, we thank you for your presence, and I know that you've spoken to us in our own language. And I believe, Lord, you are here as well as in Santex. Tonight, Lord, I pray you will draw men and women unto yourself, because this is a word for the moment and the hour. Lord, it is not your desire for any one of us to perish. We believe you, we trust you. We thank you, Lord, that you are here with us. And we pray a blessing for these who have lifted up their hands. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, let's stand up right now. Yes, I see a hand. Let's stand up here as well as in Suntec City. This is what we're going to do. In a moment, I'm going to just count to three again. If you have prayed that prayer for the very first time, you've lifted up your hand, I want you to take your belongings with you and come forward to my right and also in Suntec, come up to the right. And even if you have not lifted up your hand, you know, I know someone during this week, you have been in a cell group or somebody has been praying with you. Or if you happen to be here with a friend and you say, yeah, I didn't lift up my hand, but I'd like to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to come forward. So, so would you just make, uh, ask the friend beside you, why don't you come, okay? Let's, let's welcome that as we sing this one, one, one's true, as a, as a closing, as you come, you come, okay, you come. Okay. You come. Let's welcome them. Right now.
contact, they are still coming forward. Let's stretch our hands towards them. And I see our friends here. In front, we have a brother here. Right? And over there at Suntech, let's, let's just, just stretch our hands and then pray a blessing upon them and ask God to just seal this decision that they have made. And I believe that this is a, a, a new day and a new beginning even for their lives right now. So let's pray for them. Father, we want to thank you for our brother here and also for those who are in Suntech. We believe that, Lord, you have just called them in a very unique moment such as this. Father, we thank you that they are coming through. They are going beyond moment. And I believe, Lord, their lives will never be the same because you are going to bless them. You are going to enrich them. You are going to strengthen them. You are going to bring a family to surround them. You are going to bring friends that will walk with them. And you are going to allow them to walk into this adventure of faith because, Father, you are here for them. Lord, we bless you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Yeah. Just follow the pastors. Turn around and follow the pastors as they... As they work your way out there to the... We'll take a few moments to take some details now. Thank you. Tonight's ministry is really very simple. I had two words. One of them I already shared with you just now. Some of you need a battery change, okay? Right? Where you need to receive a new power. You have been moving on your own strength. God says, I want to give you a new power. You come. We want to pray for you. We want to pray an anointing of the Holy Spirit upon your life and whether you're here or in Suntech's name. But the other word I got was the word awaken. You know, I know some of you in one sense have been spiritually asleep and the Lord says, I want to stir it up again in your heart. You have been active many, many years ago and somehow or other you have gone into a, a slumber mode and today the Lord says, I want to do something for you and I want to wake you up. The third word that the Lord put upon my heart was that there are relationships that need to be mended and in particular, relationships in a cell. And, and I felt that the Lord was just pointing me to this scripture again because you see, the people were together in one place wherein the Holy Spirit can move, wherein the Holy Spirit can come when there was unity in that one place. Some of yourselves, I know you have been having some struggle with your cell leader or among members and you got a little bit, you know, irritated with one another. The Lord says, tonight, settle it. Let the Holy Spirit settle it for you. Come and pray and allow God to release that even into your hearts and allow God to bring a healing. And then there are several words here. Uh, there's there's a, somebody here uh, saw a vision of shattered glass and someone's life is like that. And says God says, I, I, I want to restore the, the, the wine glass. And he says, shattered wine glass. And, and I want to restore this glass for you. Okay, right? Someone here who has been in a huge debt. Okay, you, are, you have been in a huge debt and, and, and you said, you've been saying, God, I want to get through, I want to break through. Right? These are words from the intercessors. And then the last one, uh, there's a word for those who are suffering from rashes or breathing difficulty. We'd like to pray for you. We believe that God is going to heal you. And, and, and one last one, and that is that somebody has got a family member who's young, who's being hospitalized, and, and you're worried and, and, and about this situation. Come, the Lord says, I want to release you from that and, and, and uh, help you through even in that situation. So you come. Let's trust God for a Holy Spirit weekend today. A Holy Spirit weekend that is different in the sense that God wants to empower you for what He wants to do outside of this place. Come, let's come to God and hear what He says. Father, indeed, thank You that You are enough. Thank You that not only are You Lord, but You are our Saviour. And so, Father, we believe that today You have met us at our unique point of need. You've spoken to us personally, even in a big crowd like that. Father, we thank You for Your personal Holy Spirit. Father, today we receive afresh your word. And we want to pray that, Lord, even as we go forth, that indeed you will use each and every one of us, revive for you, transform for your purposes, so that, Lord, indeed this nation can see your glory and your purpose. Father, lead us on as we go beyond this moment and know that, Lord, you are with us. So, Father, we thank you. You're a God of love and that you care for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, 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 amen. God bless you. May the Holy Spirit be your guide this week.